bona tarda, em dic Marc Boyd i uh, soc un uh, escritor, escriptor uh, um, programmable web. I won't uh, show you the rest of my shitty Catalan. Um, <clears throat> but look, it's great to be here at um, the API Days. It's been a fantastic couple of days. Uh, I particularly appreciate it because it's the first API conference I've gotten to go at go to in my adopted um, home city here in Barcelona. So it's been fantastic. And um, thanks to Medi, Baptiste, Eduardo and Eleanor for organising a really great uh, two days. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'll see if I know how to do it. No, I don't know how to do that. Does that work? Oh yeah, I do. Okay, so um, uh, I'm going to talk about city government API discoverability. We often talk about the idea of smart cities, but is it really a thing? And are APIs really enabling us to have this sort of smart city vision? Well, but first of all, what I want to do is have a look at some of the lessons from successful API business study, uh, business um, uh, use cases, and then work through having a look at okay, what are API, uh, what are cities doing around API strategies? What makes a good, what makes the components of a good API city API strategy? And then I've got some thoughts on discoverability and uh, solving uh, uh, city challenges through using APIs. So we'll start with learning from API uh, business success. What I did was looked at uh, doing a similar sort of thing to what uh, Manfred was talking about yesterday. I had a look using the business model canvas. I had a look at a whole range of different APIs and looked at the growth trajectory in 2014. I've chosen four of these to look at um, with you today to just show how they've managed to gr uh, grow de developer adoption and uh, to really be able to uh, foster an um, active ecosystem around their APIs. So the, from Faber Novell have released a report called H uh, How to Engage um, the Sea Level Around APIs and they talk very much about APIs transforming businesses so that um, anything that's not um, core business to a company is externalized through an API. So that's sort of the broad brush stroke around um, business, uh, the business view of the potential of APIs. So looking at Edmunds, they were traditionally a uh, car retailer magazine, so they'd have a little magazine with lots of classified ads for cars, basically. So they realized the um, impact that digital would have on them. So while Blockbuster was saying, no, 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 it won't affect us, uh, Edmunds were actually trying to convert their whole business into a digital enterprise. So, and a big part of that has been having a really strong API strategy along with that. So now it's not just about having a, uh, a sales portal for Edmunds where people come and um, buy cars through their portal or get connected to car resellers through their portal. But by opening it up an API, they were then able to allow other websites to be able to funnel their uh, customers through to, um, through to Edmunds uh, reseller um, uh, uh, customers and so on. Uh, so here you can see what their growth looked like in 2014. Uh, there was a big jump in about April or May. That's actually because of they were advertising some API developer positions. So as soon as that happened, everyone flocked to their website, which I, get, I guess talks about the strength of having a strong API strategy because uh, people want to work for your business. Uh, this, you know, you get the best and the brightest of developers wanting to work for your business. But then apart from that sort of a little anomaly in the first half of the year, you can see a very um, uh, sort of J-curve like growth for the rest of 2014. Um, in, I'll point out at, at number three, which is around October, um, there was a developer who had been using the APIs, wrote a blog about how he was building a, 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 an iPhone 6 product based on the Edmunds API, and that really drove a, little, a bit of a bump there in developer engagement. Um, and then uh, around four, that was a lot of um, de uh, developer evangelism that was happening at the time by the um, uh, Edmunds team. And then finally, at the end of the year, there's a real push for more search, there was a real push for more searches being done for both the Edmunds API, but also for uh, something called the VIN Decoder API. So as the connected car world started to heat up, um, the, uh, Edmunds had a VIN Decoder, which is like a vehicle identification number. They've always had, they've had that for like two or three years as part of, their, uh, as part of the um, information that can come out of their APIs. And yet, 
um, because of connected car then starting to take up, more people wanted to know, okay, how can I find out a vehicle, a, the individual vehicle identification number? So more people were using a search just for that broad term and then being diverted to the Edmunds uh, APIs because that's one of their uh, endpoints. Here you can see, uh, it's really shitty on the big screen, isn't it? Um, the, here you can see the um, uh, ecosystem. So what we've got, does this? Oh yeah. So what we've got is the six API, five APIs of Edmunds, um, and then we're, then here's the SDKs. Ruby Gems is about nine thousand downloads, um, but I was really surprised. The downloads from the SDKs on GitHub was only about thirty four, and this is, we see again with a lot of the, with the other. Um, APIs I'll show you today is really like we. The, I, I personally think developer numbers are quite inflated, so it can be scary if you're just starting with an API program because you think you've got to have thousands of developers uh, working with your API. What tends to happen that out of the hundred percent of developers who sign up for your API and maybe have a tinker with it, maybe ten percent of those developers will be active in your forums or in your communities and be downloading products or having a look at um, the, the wider sort of API ecosystem you offer. And then out of those, 1% of those will actually be building something that is, has a commercial place in the market or is actually starting to generate a business of its own sort of thing. So it, can, so it means numbers can go from, um, in this case, uh, 60 to 80,000 web visits regularly to their developer portal a month down to, um, you know, like there's about 15 known apps that I was able to track that were using the Edmunds API. They've got four certified developers. But you know, like that's enough that it's actually in, uh, causing like millions, um, um, it's a multi-million dollar contribution to the Edmunds uh, revenue. One of the things I like the most about uh, the Edmunds API uh, uh, strategy is they've got this idea of the marketplace where if you're a business and you want to actually build, have products that consume the Edmunds API, you, then you click on the, um, the left-hand side of the web page and that'll take you through to, uh, to working through some of those elements around your business um, proposition. And then if you're a developer and you want to actually be aligned with uh, businesses who might be wanting to make uh, viable commercial products out of the Edmunds API, then you can click on the certified developer side of the, um, of the developer portal and you can actually build your expertise uh, in the API, and then that becomes a marketable, you, then you're actually able to use the Edmunds API developer portal as like a marketplace to say, okay, I'm a certified iOS developer uh, with Edmunds, uh, and then to be able to sort of market your dev shop to um, businesses that way. Uh, oh. So the second one we'll look at is Philips Hue. So they're the um, uh, programmable light bulbs. Here's the developer uh, website. My apologies for the, uh, it's not come up that really well on, these, uh, on this screen, hey. But anyway, we'll uh, go through. Um, so here again, you can see a pretty steady growth. I mean, Philips is different, a little bit different, of course, to things like Edmunds uh, and some of the others I'll show, just because they've got uh, such an established brand name. Uh, but all the same, they've still, you know, even a, an established brand name when releasing an API has to sort of build up a developer engagement. And here you can see that they've done that quite successfully over 2014. Uh, the, the bump in three was really because of like a Dutch hackathon that they hosted. Uh, Philips is based in uh, the Netherlands. And also because of strong conference participation by the developer evangelist team again. So developer evangelism, with all of these, we're see what I'm seeing is um, that developer evangelism is really driving uh, developer engagement. And then the jump at four is when they, uh, two things seem to be happening at around um, Octo oh, October, de November, December, was when they released an iOS SDK. And then also there was a strong user discussion around how to use uh, Philips uh, Q light bulbs in uh, home automation, on home automation websites and community discussion forums. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip those because they're too hard to read. Um, so Philips Hue, one of the things I like about their website is they've got this, this page is for their official SDKs, which they've got here, but then what they also do is they um, share user-generated uh, wrappers and functions and tools that developers in their ecosystem have um, develop, have built themselves. What I would like to see, what would be great is here, you can't really see it, but say, okay, ActionScript, 
and it describes the tool that you can download or immediately link to. And then it's got who developed it. The who developed it isn't a link. It'd be great if that was a link, so you're sort of promoting their, uh, your ecosystem more in that way. But actually, overall, Philips does do a really good job of that. They've got some apps pages, so people who make uh, things with Philips Hue, uh, make apps with Philips Hue um, APIs, you can sort of you can register them on their um, official uh, marketplace, and they do promotion of your uh, apps, apps built up with your API, with their APIs as well. And then finally, looking at sim oh no, sorry, one, one more after this, similar web. So they do website statistics uh, where, they'll, where they're tracking web usage uh, and then they've got a whole set of uh, data products that enable you to check your uh, competitors, check your um, who else is using similar keywords and all of that. It's actually um, nowadays the APIs are used by services like moz.com and HubSpot to, uh, to sort of channel their, um, uh, their sort of competitor intelligence platforms as well. And you can see really strong growth for similar web over the course of uh, uh, over the course of 2014. What the reason for at number three, where you can see some sharp growth in the middle there, and here, uh, that was when uh, similar web listed their APIs on the Microsoft Azure data marketplace and on the Salesforce App Exchange. So putting your API on directory listings was a really strong uh, growth strategy for similar web. And then at four. Uh, I love this. I love this. Um, at four, what they started to do was have a tool of the week uh, project, where they would build tools based on their APIs, so that non non developers could actually uh, gain the benefit of using the API, but in some sort of tool. So a lot of those ended up being Google Sheets tools, uh, and so that then uh, the a marketing person, if they, if they want to have a look at the competitors and track their um, uh, traffic and their keywords and everything. They can put their choice of um, uh, they can put their choice of uh, the URLs into a spreadsheet, um, attach it to the an API, and then automatically see all of that data presented without having to uh, get uh, into the nitty gritty of using the API themselves. Uh, so uh, yeah, let's get those. Okay, so yeah, this is the tool that they, this is one example of the tool. Uh, that they were using, uh, that they've created. It's a traffic estimator tool. So what you can't see here uh, is what it's, uh, you download the Google Docs tool, but then you still have to register for an API key. So you're still then funneled into their um, SaaS um, business model of using their API, but you don't actually have to do any coding. You, you do it all via a um, spreadsheet. Uh, and finally, transport API. So they have got arrangements with all, uh, uh, with all public transport operators in, in the greater London area. And then they turn all of that da those data feeds into one API, and that then that API can then be sold to um, application developers or digital out of home um, content providers who want to be able to stream some information around uh, hyperlocal uh, public transport options and all the rest. Um, okay, so then here, it's a bit like what uh, Kim was talking about yesterday when he was talking about the wholesale model of APIs, where you've got, so they're the wholesale provider, if you like, on behalf of the government, a bit like, uh, a bit like say, a public utility or a public transport operator. It's the city's infrastructure, but then they might have a tender with a private organisation to be running the trains that are on the, on the tracks and then those, uh, uh, that private operator has to then uh, fulfil certain service level, um, uh, con uh, service level um, uh, agreements around um, level of access. So here you can see they've also got a strong, uh, a strong uh, developer engagement. So all of these are looking at the website statistics from their developer portals. Uh, and here you can see that there's a steady increase over 2014. Again, <coughs> number three, it's, it was because they built some developmental tools that showed how some of the potential products you could build with their API. One of those with, was called Tube Radar, that it gives you a uh, instant glimpse of how well the, the London Metro is working, uh, whether any trains are delayed and all of the rest. And they're able to, and that's just shown as like a heat map. And so they've got that product, and they've got one called Tube uh, Transport Buzz, which is where they've mined, used text mining 
uh, APIs to mine any comments about um, being on public transport in uh, the greater London area and then they put that against a map and so and then out of because of those two products uh, that they were then picked up by the Guardian and the BBC so in three you can see where that's a bit of a jump and then in four it's because again because of the developer evangelism where they had some really active they had the uh, founders uh, and the developer team really uh, involved in a lot of conferences uh, like here Okay, uh, one of the things I really like about their developer portal is this part here is sort of like a, what they do is just before you click to link through to the actual developer portal and sign up for an API, they've got a plain English terms of use statement. So they've got a more complicated one that you can link to that's got, you know, the uh, legal type approach, but then they've just got a, you know, seven uh, dot point list of what the actual main agreements are so you can see in a in a couple of minutes whether or not that API is going to be suited to your use. So out of all of this uh, what we can learn or what cities could learn about successful API strategies. First of all, ah, oh, this is terrible, the, um, okay, the, um, uh, the starting blocks, all of the, the, the developer portals that I've uh, described here, these four, they all have these things in common. They've all got self-service registration, so you can sign up for an API key immediately and start having a play around. They've got to develop a strong developer portal separate to their main site. They've got code snippets, so you can add those in. Um, there's interactive documentation, so you can test the API calls in, the, in a form on the actual website. Uh, or they've got some other sort of sandbox arrangement where you can have a look. So maybe like the slate documentation where you've got the documentation in the middle and then on the right you've got um, a play area. Um, unfortunately I've used pink um, in a lot of the future slides as well so I'll have to be re reading it to you. Hopefully it comes up on the side ones. Does it? Oh yeah cool. So, um, so maybe look at those. Um, look at me. Uh, so and they're the th some of the ones that were sort of on the best of class, best of breed amongst the API uh, use cases I looked at. They had status pages that were constantly telling you about their uptime. They had a separate engineering blog or a separate blog uh, Twitter uh, handle sp specifically targeting their developer users. And they also had SDKs and Ruby gems. Okay, so here's the, um, for out of all of that, then if we map what the growth trajectory looks like. So anyone who's involved with uh, API, uh, being an API provider, uh, you don't have to do this all at once. So the first thing is that last slide that we just saw. So those having these sort of building blocks. This is the sort of stuff that, we, that um, you hear all the time and you've heard here even at this uh, conference around what makes a good developer portal. Uh, so, and then once that's in place and you've got a clear idea about your business model as far as how you're going to be um, uh, looking at possible monetization strategies or even putting some pricing in place or some revenue share ideas, um, that would come next. Then you get your API listed on directory sites. Then um, you're really trying to you, uh, use your API landing page and your developer portal to start trying to own your SEO keywords is what we're seeing next. It, it's only been in the last three or four months when I've been looking at this data for uh, these four plus another uh, 10 or so APIs is that I've been seeing that the, AP, the keywords for generic um, search terms are starting to influence. It's still only like, you know, 5%, 10%, but it's growing, it's growing faster now. The, um, the, the level of search, when you're doing basic searches in Google for, uh, for something like Vindicoder uh, API, as Edmunds have seen, like that is, that's happening with a few of these, that it's starting to take off. Before then, the searches were all for the brand name API. So it was before that it was always Edmunds API or something. But now I'm, we're seeing, I'm seeing a bit of a growth in keywords and I've also seen that change in the strategy that a lot of the, um, a lot of the API businesses that did have that growth hacking strategy is they're trying to take part in a greater conversation around their, their industry sector. So Contentful, which is a um, API, uh, a content management system via uh, API, they're trying, they're, talk, they're trying to own the keywords around things like content orchestration. So it's, and that's really only new, we're only seeing that with a few of these now, is that they're really trying to 
re-immerse themselves back into a broader industry or um, vertical conversation. Uh, so that seems to be coming next around owning your keywords. Uh, then, uh, and actually with that, sorry, I'll just have one more thing with that, is that that also, where you see this, and you see this with the four that I've shown, is that the, their developer teams are also engaging with their community on, um, uh, on all of the other developer forums uh, around, whether even things like Product Hunt, but much more so Stack Overflow and all of the rest. So that is also like, you know, owning, the, owning their space uh, in those forums as well. Uh, then the next stage, the SDKs, is where is what's getting built or being released then, uh, and encouraging developer, the developer com community themselves to build wrappers around the API tools, or APIs. Um, and then from there, the next one seems to be an app marketplace. So it's starting to showcase the successful products that have been built with your API. That comes next, or showcasing the developers who are building with your API. So um, that's, uh, that's, that's the next stage of growth. Uh, then people are doing things like you've seen with the similar, similar web case, where they start building tools and widgets that people can just plonk into their end products, whether that be spreadsheet or widget for their website or whatever, that is calling their API without the um, person having to, without the um, business having to, the integrator having to do that themselves. So you see growth there. And then finally, this idea of you see, you're sort of seeing these tutorials and flowcharts that again take part of this wider conversation. So Contentful talking about uh, uh, content orchestration, just generally if you're in, in the content media business. So they'll talk about that and then when they're doing a tutorial or a um, workflow around that, of course then they're inserting when you would use their API as part of that. You see this with WePay. Where, they t where they've gone beyond just being a, pl a pa platform payment um, API, and they'll have a tutorial on building an online marketplace. And then out of that tutorial, when you get to the point about payments, then they're inserting themselves and their products into that conversation. So that's one way you see the growth. The other so side of it is you also see this um, uh, ecosystem blooming. So it starts with third-party app third apps get built onto your APIs. Then the second level of blooming that seems to happen is when developers start providing API expertise um, around oh, expertise around your API as a service. So when admins do their certified developers, those certified developers can then um, advertise themselves as ad admins API experts and increase business that way. Uh, and then you also see what I've seen in these successful cases is that developers are building tool, uh, API wrappers or tools themselves, their own Ruby gems or whatever around the API. And then the API provider is saying, hey, look, this isn't an official uh, tool. It's not an official SDK, but uh, you know, like, have a look at it. You know, if it's of use, go for it. So the API businesses are definitely promoting there. I think in that second ecosystem, Bloom, I'd have to add what Kim was talking about yesterday um, in his uh, keynote that closed yesterday night, which was about um, adding services that support an API. You could add that into that section there as well. And then finally, the third ecosystem bloom is when you're getting your API out to non-technical folks. So things like building the widgets, the Google tools, uh, and then creating those tutorials. Okay. Uh, so that's the uh, business side of what we can learn. Let's take it into the city approach. So where we saw the Faber-Novell model of the um, APIs externalizing non-core functions with uh, how APIs are being in, are seen in cities, is you've sort of got the city which itself, which is the user interface, if you like. Then they call it applications, but it's really the APIs. And then there might be the digital content or like the um, government, the city services or, um, or the rest. And then administration comes in at the side and can either uh, funnel through to the user interface by the applications or can funnel and add to the, um, uh, the database, uh, data underneath that supports all of that sort of thing. I uh, don't want to go into it too much. Um, so let's have a look at a few examples. Barcelona, here's their developer portal for uh, their APIs. They've got about six or eight APIs. It's all in Catalan. Um, and it, the, it talks about it here. And it's basically just one long uh, HTML website. So not great. Um, so one of the projects I do really like is that they do invest in a fellowship where there's a code, uh, there's a, a, a coder in uh, fellowship in 
code or code fellow that's working with their government, uh, with their city council officers, and they're, and they're working on a sort of C-click fix type, an open 311 standard for the city, so that if you see uh, graffiti, you can use an app, it will automatically add it to a graffiti removal service within council, uh, within the city operations. The city operation will um, send you a text to let you know when it is actually being removed or when it is going to be removed. So it's really sort of, and what I've heard from people like Mark Head, who used to be head of um, uh, uh, open data at City of Philadelphia, is these sorts of techniques really re-engage the city around, uh, about, around being a citizen. Because you sort of, you're seeing this new responsiveness to your requests and all of that. So uh, here, this is one of the projects that's currently going on. There's quite a few others that are really great from Barcelona, of course, but um, I'm just choosing one for each. Uh, okay, Melbourne. So they've started with an open data platform. That's about as far as they've got. They're using Socrata, which is an open data um, uh, service. Has anyone heard of Socrata? No, a couple. Uh, there's also Open Data Soft, which is a Parisian um, open data platform. Juna, which is in, uh, based in Chile, uh, and a few others as well. But um, so w basically what Socrata does is they work with cities or others as well, but cities in this case, um, and you, they can upload all of their open data and then it's like an open data catalogue. So the city of Melbourne do that and they've got this data catalogue there. Uh, and a spoiler alert, I think I mentioned this later, but then Socrata, for every open data set that is on their open data platform, you can t use their um, API converter so that uh, those data sets can each be an API. What I like about Melbourne's uh, open data platform is they've got this uh, this sort of uh, uh, decision tree where it says are you a change maker then check out these uh, curated data sets if you're an entrepreneur check out these data sets if you're a planner check out these ones if you're a citizen or a reporter check out these ones so it's sort of trying to help you discover the data sets that might be most useful to you uh, New York City has got uh, a developer, por developer portal with about six or eight core APIs, uh, things like geo client mapping, um, Open 311, uh, some of those systems. What I really like about their, uh, around their um, uh, developer portal is that for everyone who signs up for a developer key, you get this, you get this uh, 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 dashboard that shows you how many calls you've made in the last month which API keys you're actually registered with, all of that sort of stuff, which I don't actually see very often with um, city developer portals. Okay, so then, uh, so these are just some examples of where things are at with cities APIs, because we hear this talk about smart cities and everything, you know, like you can um, get everything done uh, via an application now, and it's just, it's still a long way to go for doing that, because we, what we've seen with these ones is all of their uh, I, all of their developer portals are in very early stages of development um, so it, and often don't even come with a dedicated API program. What I'm also not seeing really is transactional APIs, which are more that read-write sort of uh, approach. The Open 311, where you can actually report graffiti or a pothole or some um, uh, problem in, your, in the local area and then have that added to asset maintenance repair and all of the rest, that's about that's the, where the read write is. But if you say you are opening a co-working space or something in Barcelona, so you'd have to get certain permits for that or you want to do some reconstruction so it's ready for that. Imagine if you could go to your architect, uh, talk through the plans there. They, they use an API from the city, so then you submit via them uh, through their portal um, your application for um, uh, for reconstruction or reforming a co-working space. And the API can actually say, no, you can't, it can reject you just based on you not fit, fitting all of the uh, building permit uh, application rules. And once that's all done, and then finally you've corrected your application and sent it in, um, it automatically uses a payment API to, uh, to take your, whatever your planning costs are. Uh, and then it keeps you up to date with the progress of your application. It could also use an API to then route to uh, a widget, which maybe uh, a neighborhood renewal group, uh, neighborhood associations ha could have on their websites or in their applications, so that it, to encourage community engagement around, okay, is that a good use of this property in your local area? 
So all of that could be funneled by API. So you're getting both citizen engagement around planning decisions, plus the developer getting information or being able to route their, um, uh, track the progress of their permit. And then at the end, uh, maybe once the co-working space is up and running, then the, API, uh, then the city could actually use the API to say, hey, actually, did you realise that because you're encouraging innovative business, you're entitled to these grants or, the, or these other programs of um, the city that you could access. Um, here's some widgets around public transport or local bike stands, uh, like local um, bike schemes that you can use the, to add to your portal so that it engages more with your uh, business customers and all the like. So all of that could be done by APIs. And to me, I see that as being what we're sold as the promise of, API, of smart cities and APIs now. And this is that, those brief examples we're showing we're still a fair way off from that. So if we're wanting to get there, what are the components of a good city API strategy? So first of all, the metadata level. You've got to have behind it, and I'll come back to why, of how I'd like to personally use this, but um, the work that Kim was describing yesterday, and uh, Bruno Pedro also described this in his talk, and it's been mentioned a few times, um, is the APIs.json uh, a, a specification where you can actually define, you know, describe your API in a metadata format. Uh, once, so you've got that. Then you've got standardization. For civic apps, if you want to actually scale a business that's uh, civic tech focused, then what's happening is <clears throat> people are building apps here, which is like the, so they're building for, say, the city of Barcelona. Then if they want to act, if they think, okay, this is an idea that will we'll really take off, the difficulty is that um, then they need to get to this stage where, where they can be much more of a platform where they're using uh, the same sort of code base in any city. But in order to do that, they need um, open API standards to be able to replicate their API, uh, their um, application in multiple cities. I'll just grab some water. So we really need API, st so there is a need for sort of open API standardization um, in order to enable those businesses who do want to take the courage and start building civic tech solutions to then be able to um, scale those businesses <coughs> across city locations. Okay, next one is directory listing. So as we saw with similar web, when they got a bump in their, um, uh, in their developer engagement, it was because they were listed in appropriate um, API developer listings. So for example, programmable web. <coughs> but we've also heard from Mashape this weekend, and there's a list of 142 d data portals um, at this address, so they could list them on that. Uh, you can list them on that as well. Or well, the city's good. Then you actually do need a developer portal. I'm not really seeing a developer portal. If you look back, I won't run back through the um, Edmonds one, but Edmonds was the one developer portal for their five APIs. What you see from cities is things like Barcelona, where it's just one list that goes down, or you're seeing a separate, one, a separate door for bike, uh, bike rental scheme APIs and a separate door for, um, uh, uh, for museum locations APIs. So there's no central portal. Here's the Philadelphia one, which lists the, their main APIs that they provide. And actually at the top it says, we're making a really awesome one soon, so come back and check it out. So, um, so, so some, some cities are thinking about this, but it's very early days as far as thinking about that. Um, they, where they are progressing is the open data platform. So here's the city of New York's open data platform. It's built on Socrata, which means you can consume um, all of that data via the Socrata open data API. So it's not really a, a local, it's not really a city run API, but it is available. It's like a thousand calls an hour. Uh, so it would be good for cities to have a, sort of, some sort of social media strategy, at least a Google group maybe, and maybe a separate Twitter handle, but definitely a Google group. The difficulty with that is you see things like the New York City Metropolitan Transit, Transit Authority, which has a really strong API, um, and then it takes like a week and a half for any of the staff from the MTA to actually respond to what uh, the developers need if something goes wrong. So there is a resourcing commitment to this as well. Hackathons, accelerators, and developer summits. 
uh, as another part of the API strategy. Where that's really success, where I see hackathons, I'm not a big fan of hackathons, but where I see them success is often the mayor comes along because then that's a big opportunity for the mayor to have a photo taken in the media and be seen as being innovative. But often that's when I've heard from people with the Code for America that that's when the mayor goes, oh, APIs, you know, like this is all possible. What do you mean we could actually be doing our planning permissions by API? You know, like all of that starts to happen because the, that's how the mayor or the decision makers, makers within a city are exposed. What I like much more is like, like developer summits or accelerators where you might actually be funding um, civic ha uh, funding startups or businesses to be able to build a pro build a uh, an app over say a six month period. <coughs> so there's actually a smart city app hack here in Barcelona that's just started and goes through till uh, October, and you can get mentored for, to build a mobile app, smart city app. And the idea then is that because it's a six month scheme, it's about trying to build this sustainability and uh, you know, really trying to think through some of the more difficult things rather than just an idea for a map with all of the public toilets that are in the city and that being done on, over a weekend, which is pretty much what you get from a hackathon. Thanks. <coughs> um, okay. The, uh, uh, so uh, the next element will be storytelling. So you see on the, um, on the um, New York City developer portal, they've actually got three. Uh, they've got more than that. It's a longer list. They've got um, a number of like use cases where they describe how people are using their open data and their APIs to actually re-engage with particular parts of the community or build new visualizations or new applications. One idea I like that I haven't seen take off at all yet is uh, from New Zealand government where they've got a particular portal for businesses to say to businesses, this is what an API is. What APIs do you need from government to do your business better? Uh, that sort of thing. So it's sort of like a, um, the way to try to introduce business, business strategy around API and using um, government APIs. I think this will be great once you get to that whole transactional API stage of like read writing APIs. Then they need the whole uh, web, uh, that tooling thing of uh, integration so that non-technical users can uh, use their APIs. Uh, web tools and widgets, just like with the private ones. And then I think also for city, city, at the city level, there's a real need for an equity lens as well. I think there's a, a, a um, responsibility for cities to be able to say, okay, here's the open data that we're providing to you via API. Here's some of the things you could do with it. Here's how to go about using that um, open data and API supply in order to reduce the in social inequality or to make sure that those who we normally marginalise because of the way we structure society already, that we're not repeating that in a digitised um, uh, uh, city uh, platform. So here's an example from, this is from an independent group that's funded by the Detroit City Council called Data Driven Detroit, and they use the APIs in this case to show where students live in, um, in, uh, in Detroit, and then you can actually map that against uh, things like public transport access or something like that, or you know maybe education scores. Uh, 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 so what I'm what I'm again like you see the public tra you see the transport data released by API, but there's no one no city is actually saying hey did you know if you combine this with census uh, APIs you can then see where the transport is via uh, mapped by socioeconomic uh, advantage of the area. So, and then you actually see the inverse care uh, ratio exposed, which is basically that all of our resources go to the um, well, uh, w the higher socioeconomic areas, and none of the resources go to the lower socioeconomic areas. And you see that in like food systems, in public transport, in good education, all the rest. So again, applying that, having that equity lens built into how you consider your API being used. And then I really like this whole user dashboard, like we saw with New York. Um, and I'm just going to skip over this, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's sort of silly to skip over it in a way, because like here these things, these are the hardest things that I'm saying, oh yeah, and do this. But this is like the prevailing policy context that a city would need for their API strategy. So you need digital workers, you actually need workers who are interested in um, using SaaS applications in their work, who, are, who, are, who at home have Sunrise app connected to their Google Calendar, and who are using you know inbox or you know using a 
uh, thinking through some of, or who are excited by the potential of Mailjet or Context IO in their uh, government work. You know, it's like you need digital workers to be excited and thinking about using their mobile uh, in the workplace. Um, you need procurement policies where it's, so things like Open Data Soft, which is an open data platform that's completely subscription based, they can't often get their foot in the door to sell their product to uh, cities because they're not charging enough. They've got a subscription based SaaS model that's like quite minimal and then cities are like, oh no, well we need to go to uh, request for tender process and it's got to be, you know, 10,000 a year or whatever. And they're like, no, well this, that's, we're, we're a SaaS business, you know, that's not our model. So even the doors closed because the procurement policies aren't, um, aren't, up, uh, aren't ready for the new economy. Um, I'll skip through it. Okay. Uh, so then just finally, I'll finish with this. Uh, then, so out of all of this, then uh, this will be what I propose as a sort of approach to city government API discoverability based on what we've heard over the past two days. So imagine if you're a business and you're wanting to start using uh, city APIs to be able to build your products, then what about if instead of trying to go through all of those open data platforms and identify which APIs might be suitable to you, what if you just put in your Twitter handle, your LinkedIn uh, profile or your business URL, and then what if we use text mining APIs and out of that we identified a set of keywords for say the past six months that were, in, that were obviously relevant to your business. So if we had that, plus we'd also be able to do text mining over the type of business you are and identify your industry sector, uh, the size of your business, all of those sorts of things. So you'd be able to figure out most of that just from those sorts of, a from funneling APIs from those. So once you've got that, then what if you had all of your APIs with APIs JSON metadata and then you were able to do a sort of search using instead the keywords and the business properties against the APIs JSON for all of your APIs in your city government. And so then out of that, you'd then get like a recommendation engine that would be saying to you, okay, here are some APIs that you could build products with given that you're in the energy sector. You know, these are, these are the ones that might be relevant to you. Um, and then they could also say, they could also start having APIs to transact with, to, to be able to, to be saying, oh, and by the way, did you know that you can uh, complete your occupational health and safety uh, requirements via API because you're a business of less than five people or something like that? So that, you know, like say that you're getting, uh, instead of people having to go through a list of open data or APIs that's like a, a hundred and, or, you know, 170, 230, up to thousands long, uh, you can actually, uh, do, you know, come up with a sort of recommendation engine. The other way might be doing something like using APIs.io and then something with uh, like a, uh, some sort of mutant hybrid between APIs.io and Civ Omega, which is a natural language uh, search engine for civic data. And again, if that was put through a natural language processing like we heard earlier today, we'd get a plain language sort of um, uh, a statement of what you're searching for. Again, match that against your APIs JSON metadata, and again, you get to this idea of, okay, here's APIs that you can build with, and here's APIs you can transact with. Uh, I've got more, but it's, a, <laughs> but it's a long day, and uh, I had a lot to put in there, so I might actually just leave it at that, but if you want to talk about this uh, with me afterwards, I'll be around for a while. Um, um, sorry? At the bar, yeah. Okay, cool. So thanks, everyone. That, so the main idea is, I guess, we're about trying to encourage new civic tech innovation uh, for smart cities and, some of the, and how early in the road we are, but how APIs can help us get there much faster. Okay, thanks. So, you handle one or two questions? Yeah? yeah, sure. Okay. I can talk this about this all night. So one question. Hey, uh, it's a good talk. So um, got a two-part question. Most of the APIs, what, what you talked about, seem to be informational, right? Uh, it's getting the data out about something about the city. It's publishing out. Others can come and use it. Um, 
have you seen any cities using more of a dynamic way, meaning, okay, so the traffic is too heavy here, so I want to start routing the traffic based on my API information, that kind of thing. If you have any examples, I want to hear about that. And the second part, have you seen any cities start using these APIs for monetization purpose, start monetizing rather than informational purpose? Uh, no, not really seen anything for the monetization. Um, they're not even, their terms of use aren't even really clear that you're allowed to do that um, with, their, with their APIs, you know, um, is part of the problem. And also there's no SLA type of agreement at all. So there's no, if you did want to build uh, a commercial product with using city level APIs, there's no uh, uh, guarantee that that supply will be ongoing. It's not, it's being treated as like a, um, a, a novel, uh, add-on to how government does business rather than being seen as this could be transformative in how we engage with our citizens. So, uh, And until they actually see it like that and see it as a utility, then that won't happen. And that's part of the reason why I'm trying to you know, bang the drum here with this sort of talk. Um, the, the issue on the transactional stuff, uh, I think there is some stuff that there are internal APIs that are routing uh, information internally. It's not often opened up that well to the public. Uh, to the public, there is Open 311 data that's often opened up. I don't, which is great for transparency. I don't see how you could build, other than a nicer interface. I don't see how you could build a commercial product necessarily on that, um, unless you're mining that for like some sort of developer type of. Um, uh, analytics, for, but yeah, like uh, I think there's some great products you could actually build from a uh, from like the data kind sort of world where you're looking at okay, do, when people complain of a pothole or a road closure in one area, um, do they get serviced faster because they're in a higher socioeconomic area than people um, in this area, or do we not see the calls at all from the lower socioeconomic area? Like you could do some great analysis of that. As far as the commercial side, I don't know that you could build that. But that's about the only one that's transactional that's uh, externally facing from what I really see. But oh, bike, bike rental, uh, bike, uh, like the Bissing stops. You can actually get APIs to see um, you know, how, many, how many are free at that a particular station and all of that sort of stuff. And that's meant to be in real time. But then that data isn't used internally. Apart from, uh, Louis got an example of one that's used internally to identify how to redistribute the bikes. But if anyone uses the bike scheme here, does anyone else use Bissing here? And then, like, yeah, uh, you know not to use it, but I know not to use it between four and six in the evening because I'm, where I'm going, there will never be a bike uh, position free. They're always all taken, you know? So like. You could actually mine the data to be able to yeah. distribute the bikes but, better. But if everybody follows your advice, this is why there is never a spot because nobody takes it to have a free spot on the other side, yeah. right? So yes, <laughs> they should do it. They should release the data. Yeah. yeah. So um, the the, the um, in the UK, the local governments have uh, have targets for opening up data, but what tends to happen is the way they meet those targets is they open up things like um, council minutes and expenses reports and stuff like that. But the things that really get developers and companies interested is like real-time data, like you know, transport information, like live data feeds. How do you, uh, and the problem is that's the hardest stuff to get. The really interesting stuff is by far the hardest stuff to get because it's outsourced to a company or something like that. So how do you overcome, like, how do you encourage the government to go more than just do what they have to, but actually overcome uh, the challenges involved in providing really interesting data that's actually going to be used by people. Yeah, um, I, think, I think some of the models for the real-time sensor and all of that sort of data, Centillo, which is, a, which is funded by Barcelona City Council as a way of trying to do that, that's got quite an intro, that's trying to sort of build like an IoT sensor infrastructure for a city so that then you could be able to release. So they have got some real-time feeds coming out of that. Um, uh, as far as, but it's, again, it's things like locations of things, like or it's some air temperature uh, information and noise pollution type stuff. Uh, but again, but it's, it's really in beta, beta stage at the moment, that sort of thing. Um, I think 
And the transport's sewn up for in the UK or at least in London, then Transport API has all of those agreements. They're now actually selling that, uh, their, API, their single API back to councils so that councils can have maps that show real time in their websites and all of the rest. Well, but, well yep. actually in the case of my, where I live, I don't live in London, but, but in the city where I live, the, the transport data exists. There's, or there's, there's contracts out to a few companies that provide that. All of them are contract to a single company that collects all of the location data and, and uh, bus number information. They collect all that data and they sell it back to the council. So they provided that and they sell it back. So it's not in their interest to open that data up because they're making pots of cash being paid to sell data back to the council. Yeah. So I, I don't know, like this is actually something I'm trying to work on, but I don't know how you overcome that. Like the council doesn't have the resources to fight that, yeah. and the organizations have no motivation whatsoever to cut off an income stream. Yeah, yeah. So, um, no, that's, that's a diff let's talk more about that uh, in the break. <laughs> but no, I mean, but I mean, I think some of it is, some of it's a bit like utility, some of it is like that public transport utility stuff. I think there's got to be a certain level of free use. And I think, I mean, certainly I know with Transport API, for example, um, they sell to councils at a reduced rate, but it's a little bit like, but then, yeah, but you're right, there needs to be some, there needs to be a better approach, there needs to be a better um, financing of that system because it's a bit like how councils, I think they lease their public transport, uh, their land that public transport runs on, they lease that to the public transport providers who then return that. So, I mean, it's a complicated business model, but yeah, I mean, like, outside of transport, um, but a lot of that, I think it needs like that, it needs a few more, um, it needs some incubating mo incubator money to be able to try to start a startup sector around this sort of stuff. And then it needs um, some storytelling around some use cases that are actually going to actually either um, leverage new business in the local economy um, and, then, and, and provide something for citizens as well. There is also the French way to do it. So if it's a commons, then they raise tax <laughs> and they leave it for free, but everybody pays, uh, uh, you know, in the city or whatever. But it's a way to, to release it like uh, for free. But I don't know if in UK, like you say, hey, we raise tax to give data for free. Say, mm, I don't know, but maybe it's a solution. Huh? This would be a hard sell. <laughs> yeah. The, well, I, one thing I didn't get to get to was I see there's five areas where cities could actually be trying to push ahead with this stuff. So multimodal transport is one of those, um, food systems, nighttime economic vitality the urban heat island effect and uh, stimulating micro enterprise and innovation. If you solve, if you work on some sort of API project that's, that's solving an issue in those, one of those five domains, you're pretty much crossing, where's my other one? You're pretty much crossing all of, oh no, I'm going the wrong way. You're solving all of, you're working across all of government, local governments, um, all of these are their sort of like vertical responsibilities and then uh, so then these issues cross all of those. So you would sort of be able to unpack things like business models, um, uh, commercial opportunity, uh, improved citizen life in a local community, uh, you know, and, and also how then do you have to link up different APIs and different data sets across a local government. So I'm, yeah, really trying to push on these at the moment. But I, I can talk to you a bit more about that after. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, cool. Uh, maybe? Thanks, maybe. Okay. What? Last okay, question? so last question of the okay, event. So last question to Ken. So, I mean, my question is, a lot of this conversation is just around uh, data. You know, that seems to be the main theme around open, you know, we're at the stage of data. How do we get to API? How do you sell that we need to think API over data? Because I fight with a lot of people who say, APIs are meaningless, full data download. Just give me the data and let me go with it. APIs are useless. APIs are about control. So how do we, we go from data to API? I, I, think you, I think it needs to go back to one of the core parts of council operations, which is planning and permits. So I think if that was, then we're actually getting into, into transactional APIs, which is where the government service as a platform uh, argument really starts to kick up. And I think that's where it's really exciting. Like, so it, the open data stuff, it's all, it tends to be static data. They push it once out, 
you know, bus stop locations or whatever. And if that bus stop location changes, they don't really care because they've got 2013 data up and that's it done. But I think where it would be great is where they release APIs around planning permits, where it was about if you could be able to submit your planning permit all via API so that when the, if, it, if you're not filled in the form or something properly, then it'll reject it for you there. The closest you get is things like Barcelona City, where they've got an e-government portal. You go to that portal and it has all these different operations like filling in a planning permit or whatever. And so then from there, you get to click to print off the form on your own computer and it tells you, which, you can order it which, um, or you can put in a date to go to an appointment, but you've still got to then just use the forms to fill it out. Like it needs that, the form to be the API rather than being click, you know, print off this form and bring it into us, you know, like, and so once that happens around some simple stuff around, to me, planning, if you start there, then you get into, you can use that to engage with communities about their changes rather than putting up, rather than just putting up um, posters, uh, because like in 1970 or something, but it's still done, you know, like you just stick a sign on the front of a building that you're going to demolish and build something new there. But like, so you can engage with communities better via API that way. Uh, but then also, so then, but the other side, so then that's a win. The win for the city council as far as if you can submit your planning permit is it's a much faster and more efficient process for the city. They don't have to send back the um, permits or have someone hand checking them for basic things that are just part of the planning regulations. So, you know, like that's an efficiency game, which is the savings of that you invest in an API strategy for planning, you know, sort of thing and sort of, you know, hope that's to me that that's where the cost savings argument hopefully you can win. But I mean, I know it's a political, there's, it's politics that's holding all of this back, you know, sort of thing. So. Yeah, uh, the reading writer, we could solve that problem. Yeah, it's about like, yeah, it's, it's winning hearts and minds so again, you know, sort of thing. I think, so, I think maybe there's some of that. I think it's much more about, I mean, in my experience in local government was it's much more about exposing, the, exposing, uh, uh, exposing transparency. <laughs> Which is what, yeah. That's what people don't necessarily really want to do. So transparency is about to be transparent? Really? Oh, no, 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 no. Let, let's avoid that, right? So, yeah. Okay. You can't, yeah. We'll finish on these words. Thank Thanks. you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So. Mm -hmm.